I want to start by asking a question. I've already answered it, but, but I want to give you a little bit more in depth. Seeing as we are here, we may do a little bit slightly more in depth. Why is fasting so powerful? And as I've said, it's not the fasting, it's the heart, the humble, the, the physical act of humbling oneself. It's the heart motive behind it. It's the desire to seek the Lord. It's the desire to seek revelation, understanding, breakthrough, fasting for others. It's the heart. It's the heart motive. When Jesus spoke about fasting, he didn't mention type or length. He mentioned the heart. He spoke about the heart. But why is it so powerful? And I've kind of already said that because of the soul. But let's go look at a little, bit, a little bit of Scripture. You can go turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3 and 1 John chapter 2. So you can flip between those. Just a quick little list. Fasting in the Old Testament, as we've just read, brought supernatural comfort in times of mourning. Daniel fasted to gain understanding of a vision. Fasting was employed to rescue the nation of God under Esther. Fasting was used as a tool when they needed protection and direction. Fasted assisted in opening the way for Nehemiah to find courage and, and strategy. And fasting was the expression Jehoshaphat chose when he was overwhelmed and out of answers. And if you've ever been a leader for five minutes, you will be overwhelmed sometimes and without answers. So why is it so powerful? Because it affects your appetites, your affections, and your mindset. Your appetites, your affections and your mindsets. Fasting intentionally impacts the areas of our lives that are pursued, hear this, and used by the unseen realm, meaning Satan. Fasting intentionally impacts the areas of our lives that are pursued by the enemy and used by the enemy as a means of influence over us. Fasting directly touches on every one of those areas. So, Let's go look. Philippians chapter 3. Let me quickly find it. Don't let these verses put you into condemnation or legalism. Please don't allow that. Philippians 3.17, Paul speaking, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk. In other words, who walk like he did. As you have us for a pattern, for many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. That's very strong language. And he's talking about, you know, false leaders, false prophets, and false people that would come into some of these New Testament churches and start spreading heresies and start telling them they must either go back to legalism, go back to the Old Testament law, or combine it with Greek mythology. It's all sorts of crazy stuff. But um, he says, now even tell you weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, this is a famous couple of verses, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame and who set their mind on earthly things. Okay? He's saying that's the issue. Whose, whose God is their belly, and that doesn't just mean food, it means appetites, natural appetites for life. God is their belly whose glory is in their shame, meaning they're exalting things, they take glory in things that, shouldn't be, that, are, that should be actually shameful. We see that today. You know, we see it all over us. We see it on TV. People glory in things that are actually disgusting. People glory in things that are actually depraved. They've now found glory in it, okay? That's not unusual for us. Uh, who set their mind on earthly things. But look what he says next. He goes straight into this. This is, in a sense, but you are. He says, for your citizenship is in heaven. So he says, that's what you're surrounded by. When you're surrounded by that, remember where your actual citizenship is and where your authority comes from. He says, your citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that there was a, also there's a heresy, it, it tried to come back a little while ago, that said that Jesus never resurrected physically, but, but he kind of lives in us. You know that like in the movies, when someone passes in a movie and says, he lives on in you, which is weird. But, you know, it's like comforting. And, and th that started to happen like with the people like, Jesus didn't actually r resurrect, uh, but he lives on in us you know, in our memories and thoughts. No, it, it says here, heaven from where Jesus is coming. So it's very simple. Uh, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So 
It talks about whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, and who set their mind on earthly things. If you flip to 1 John chapter 2, another very famous verse, and it actually is all three of them are pretty much the same thing. They're just used differently. 1 uh, John 2 verse 16. Let's go to verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world or the things of the world, the Father is not in him. How's this? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of, the, and the pride of life. You've heard this scripture, right? It's like a children's church scripture. It's been quoted many times. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Those three are actually pretty similar. Whose God is their belly, that's like the lust of the flesh. It's not necessarily about eating, but a broader reference for living. A broader reference for living. Whose glory is in their shame, that's like the pride of life. They gloried about the things they shouldn't have been in competition to advance themselves on a worldly scale. You have to do things to get a promotion. You have to do things to be seen. You have to do things to become a famous actor. You have to do things that you don't want to do. Whose glory is their shame. Who set their mind on earthly things. That's like lust of the eyes. So, when it talks about lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh, when we talk about lust, people are like, I thought we were talking about fasting. Well, we are. Lust is always used or spoken of as a sexual thing. You know, he has lust in his heart or whatever. But that's actually not strictly the biblical term. It, it can be used for that. But what lust actually is, and when the Lord began to show me this, it, it changes the way you see things, that lust is actually a, nat a natural God-given desire that is then corrupted by the enemy, is twisted, perverted or twisted, and then empowered by the demonic realm. So God gives you the desire for sex. That's normal. God gives you the desire even to be a leader. People say it's power hungry. The Bible's thing, it's a noble thing to desire the task of an overseer. God gives people certain callings and certain desires, normal things, to desire to have influence. That comes from the Lord because He says, until I come back, occupy, rule. So these are natural, normal desires that God's given us. And some of the churches said are so bad that if you even think like that, you're terrible. But sometimes God's speaking to you. Hey, I want you to rule. Hey, I want you to lead. Hey, I want you to do this. And you're like, I'm being prideful. No, it's probably the Lord. But then what lust, when that happens, even physical attraction, you know, that's normal. But then what happens is this normal, natural thing that God gives people, the enemy jumps on it in a sense because he can create. He jumps on this thing and starts to twist it a little bit, even just a little bit, and pervert it a little bit. And then once it's a little bit corrupted, then he empowers it. That's lust. It takes a natural desire for sex, natural desire for intimacy, a natural desire for leadership, twists it and corrupts it, puts self at the center, and then empowers it in that direction even though it originally probably came from the Lord. Does that make sense? So why is fasting so powerful? Well, because it says here, whose God is their belly. So you can say, man, that person has a real appetite for life, a real appetite for sport, nothing bad, a real appetite for this, a real appetite for that. So these are, like I said, natural appetites. But it uses the word God whose God is their belly. In other words, some of those natural appetites, if left alone, they actually desire to rule over you, whose God is their belly. Something that God has given you to rule over in your own life and something that God has given you to function through and even maybe has called you through, those things, if not put under submission in your life, become like a God. They start to rule you whose God is their belly. And so those things become demonically empowered and they start to rule over you. The natural, even appetite for sport, even appetite for that, God-given. But if they're slightly corrupted, then those things start to rule over us and it becomes unhealthy. Who knows what I'm talking about? But it's very hard to call it unhealthy because they you know, they're actually doing well. And then you can't be like, well, that's unhealthy. I see some young people especially put their identity in the wrong thing. Some, some young people put their identity in ministry. 
and they at every meeting, and they at every prayer meeting, and they're there first, and they leave last, and there's something so commendable about that. But in my heart, I'm waiting for them to come to the end of that. Because I'm like, your identity is not what you do for the Lord. Your identity is not ministry. Your identity is son. Your identity is daughter. And I'm like waiting for them to come to the end of the striving so they can actually be useful for the kingdom. And it's a good desire, but then it's empowered. Does that, I, I don't mean to confuse you. Does that make sense? And that's sometimes when the Holy Spirit goes quiet. Not on His part, on ours. The Holy Spirit's voice seems to slowly go quiet. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. So, what starts to happen is we start to move from faith into materialism. What do I mean? What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the, the conviction of things unseen. Hebrews 11, chapter 1. So faith is the substance, the word hypostasis, it means the underlying reality. So, and the conviction of things unseen, meaning I have a conviction in my heart about something in the unseen realm, meaning heaven, not the demonic realm, or I have a conviction in my heart about how the unseen realm works and how the unseen realm responds to my speaking, to my behavior, to my speech, to my praise, to my worship, to my prayer. I have a conviction in my heart. I know it to be true, and it feels like I already have the evidence in my heart because it's based on an underlying reality. I can't see it, but I know like I know like I know. And so I can do something in faith and actually something starts to happen and transpire, even though the reason I do it is not, I can't give you an explanation for it. It's a conviction about something I can't see. We understand that. That's faith. I have a conviction in my heart, and that conviction is like evidence to us. It's like a proof to us. It's like I don't need proof. I know it in my heart. That's faith. It's a reliance. It was Billy Graham. He was in the Amazon jungle when he was still younger, just starting the first 10 years or whatever, and he actually wrote a book on faith. And he was in the jungle, and he came out of a hut, and he saw an old man. He said he looked 150 years old, <laughs> but he was an old man. He had built this little bamboo chair, and he was, you know, just, and he said, and he was laying on the chair. And he said to the man, what are you doing? And he said, he looked at Billy Graham, he said, I'm reclining. It's just a strange thing to say, but he said, I'm reclining. And as he said that, the Holy Spirit said to Billy Graham, that's faith, put all your weight on it. Rest, trust it, put all your weight on it. When you put all your weight on something in the unseen realm, you lean on something, that's faith. You lean on it. And so that's faith. What is materialism? Materialism is not the love of things. Materialism is this. It's reliance upon the seen above the unseen. That's actually what materialism is. It causes you to put your trust and your hope and your reliance on the seen above the unseen. Now, that doesn't mean you get weird. You're like, I just float around. No, of, you know, you need to go to work. You need to mow the grass. But when, it, when the rubber meets the road, when things get, and where do you run? Do you run to the Lord and put your weight and recline on that in faith, even though it doesn't make sense? Or do you run to try to figure it out, make a plan, make it work? I must work harder. I must. That's actually a form of materialism. Fasting directly affects the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Directly affects it. It makes no sense in the pride of life. How do you explain to someone in the business world, in an unsafe person, I'm not eating? What is fasting? I'm abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. They're like, Good job, buddy. This is like, I'm not going to speak to that guy again. How do you explain that? Because they don't have the conviction in their heart. So it makes no sense for the pride of life. No, it makes no sense to actually advance yourself. But in the kingdom, it makes a whole bunch of sense. A whole bunch of sense, all through the Bible, as we've seen. And it directly affects the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. What I want, what I feel like. My soul language. I want, I think, I feel. It directly impacts that that I was telling you about. Like directly. It's a direct assault. It's not we're over here. No, it's a direct assault onto that. 
and that's partly what makes it extremely powerful. It reminds the appetites of life. You are not in charge. You are actually not in charge. My spirit is in charge. That's what it does. It reminds your affection, your heart. It actually starts to restore your affections for the Lord. There have been times that I've fasted just because I can feel myself drifting. It happens to all of us. We drift. The Lord's over there, and we just drift, and we don't realize it. It's not evil. It's not, it happens to every person. Pastors, too, probably sometimes more. And, they, and we drift. And I've just learned one of the fastest ways to restore my affection is not me trying to impress God. It's just one of the fastest ways to restore affection. It's just to fast for a little bit because it's a direct assault. It's like the 9 mil wasn't working. Sorry for anti-gun people. The 45 wasn't working, so I take out the 50 caliber. It's like I need, to, I need to, a little bit more power here. That's what fasting does. It's the difference between two cars racing. So something that the Lord actually showed me in a dream. The two cars racing and the one like, you know, it's like one like this, like that, and then the one kind of slows down and the other one wins. But it's kind of close. Sometimes the race between your flesh and your spirit is like that in a decision. It's like your spirit's winning and then the flesh comes in and then the spirit's winning and then the flesh comes in and then the spirit's willing and then you fight with your wife and then you're like, I don't feel like doing anything with the Lord right now, my wife, and then your spirit comes in, and then the dog breaks something, and now you've got to pay for something, and it's like, you know, it's like that. Fasting, what it does, it's the difference between that versus that one car turns around and literally drives in the opposite direction. The gap widens even if one of them stops. It's, it's totally different to a normal day. It's, victory is much faster. So, why else? Physical obedience. I wish we had time to go into this one, but I'll just go through it as fast as I can. Physical obedience. Name in the Syrian with the prophet. What did the prophet say? Go and dip yourself in the river. Right? Prophet didn't even come out. Name in the Syrian goes to Elijah, uh, Elijah and he says, what must I do? The prophet doesn't even come out. He just says, go dip in the river. And he gets all like offended. And the servant has to be like, his, this guy's servant has to be like, maybe you should just do it. It's not even that hard. Like just dip seven times. And I want you to notice that it wasn't the presence of the prophet that does the miracle. That's how we think. The man of God, the person of God. It was the words that God had told him to say. It wasn't the presence of the person. It was the presence of what God had said that went with him. The word of God. The prophet didn't even come out. When he obeyed physically, even though there was no faith, there was clearly no faith, right? Zero faith. He's just like, this is not going to work. This is nuts. And his servant's like, just do it, dude, in modern vernacular. And he did it, and he was healed. Physical obedience brings us spiritual release. What about Joshua? Walk around the, walk around the city. Makes no sense. What about... Elijah, a widow starving to death, he says, feed me the last of your food. Something she had to go physically prepare and do. What about uh, uh, Exodus 17 with Moses, Aaron, and Ur holding up the arms? Moses and you know, the Aaron and Ur hold up his arms. When his arms drop, they start losing. But it's just a phys it's weird, right? You think, Lord, why? Because he's trying to teach us something. Physical obedience will bring a supernatural spiritual release. But it's not physical acts, it's physical obedience. It's physical acts of something God has said. Not just physical acts because that's what you want to do. That's where people get weird. I'm going to dance and that's, okay, dancing is actually in the Bible, but I'm going to do something like very spiritual and it's very demonstrative. I'm like, great, did God tell you to do that? Because otherwise it's just a physical act. It's physical obedience. There's a difference. Physical obedience will bring spiritual release. Sometimes you're reading scripture and you get a conviction, like I actually had that once just about dancing. If 
by myself. And the Lord told me, you're not going to get breakthrough till you dance. And I can't dance, and it's weird. And I was by myself, and it just felt awkward, you know, like is the cat looking at me, whatever. And you, but it was a physical obedience, even though it was probably traumatic for someone to watch. But there was a physical obedience, and instantly the heaviness lifted, and all this revelation started coming to me. Physical obedience brings spiritual release, but it must be obedience, not just what I feel like doing. That's where you get into the hyper weird stuff. I think you guys know what I'm saying. Okay? Physical obedience brings spiritual release. As a modern church, as a modern people, we've internalized everything just to the soul. I want, I feel, I think. And sometimes I want to ask people, have you forgotten the power of physical expression? Have we forgotten, as a people, the power of physical expression? Because when I go to sport, you know, you go to a sports stadium, people haven't forgotten the power of physical expression. They just remove it from their spirituality. Why? I don't know. It's all through the Bible. So we say, I don't need to clap my hands. The Bible says, clap your hands, all you people. He said, I don't need to clap my hands. I don't need to raise my arms. The Lord knows that in my heart I'm doing it. Wrong. Physical obedience brings spiritual release. I never need to worship in private like I do in public. The Lord sees my heart. Wrong. What about, I don't need to use my mouth to actually speak out things that God says or to speak out my future or to speak out what God has said to me. I don't need to use my mouth to speak. I'm just going to think it. God sees my heart. Wrong. I don't need to fast physically, the physical act of humbling myself. God knows that I'm humble in my heart. Wrong. A physical act will bring spiritual release. It will. That's in the Bible. And they knew it then, and we forget it today. We could end there, but I'm going to say one more quick thing. I'm probably going to do this again on Sunday, but just very quick. Can you go in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, and then we'll end with this. Who's ever heard Jesus tell the story? I'm sure you've heard of it. Jesus tells a story about um, the wineskin. You know, you can't put old wine in, uh, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. Well, you know what's very interesting is that passage of scripture was a response to a question about fasting. So let's go look at it. Luke 5 verse 33. Then they said to him, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? I like that, make prayers. We could preach about that, but we won't. Why the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees. The Pharisees, by the way, used to fast every, every Monday and Thursday, I think it was. Well, they called it different, but it was twice a week. And one of the things Jesus said about fasting, he said he gave this parable of a Pharisee, of a so-called like spiritual man standing on the street corner and saying, I thank you, Luke 18, 12, I thank you that I'm not like that man. I fast twice a week, and I... And he says, and then next to him there was a sinner who goes, Lord, I'm, I'm, help me. And then he says, which one do you think left justified? He uses the word justified. This guy who's fasting twice a week or this guy who's honest with the Lord? See, because it's not the fasting. Fasting is the tool, is the key that you turn. It's the heart position. And this great tool that God had given them in th throughout the Bible, even by the time of Isaiah's day, they were using fasting, and they were, ex as I said on Sunday, they were exploiting their laborers. They wouldn't let them take the actual Sabbath, which was for the Day of Atonement, and making them work. And Isaiah's like, is this the fast that you have chosen? You think you've actually understood the heart that it was supposed to be in? So by the time of Isaiah, it already started to go kind of skew. By the time Jesus arrives on the scene, Think about this. What does fasting do? What's the number one thing? It's to humble yourself, right? 
by the time Jesus arrived, they were taking the one physical thing that Jesus, that God had given them to humble themselves and using it as a point of spiritual pride. They were using it to exalt themselves. Look how spiritual we are. We fast twice a week. And he's like, oh my goodness. It was <laughs> to humble you. It was a gift. We gave you a gift so you could humble yourself. Because I give grace to the humble. I draw near to the humble. I bless the humble. And you can't humble yourself by thinking. So we gave you a gift that you can turn at any time. And now you're using the gift to say, look at me. And it's just fascinating to me that it's like it had been flipped on its head and these great scripture scribes and Pharisees and experts on the law couldn't even see that that's what was happening. Because without the Holy Spirit, don't be offended, this will not be revealed to you. You can know it by heart. You need the Holy Spirit to make it come alive. But he says this, Luke 5, he says, uh, and says, why do, sorry, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees? But yours eat and drink. And he said to them, Jesus speaking, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Which days are those? Today. Right? So we are in a day where people fast. That's what Jesus said. Then he said this. Then he spoke a parable to them. No one put a piece of a new garment. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. So there's two garments. Okay. Otherwise the new makes a tear and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. So they're used to talking about garments. Sometimes they used to often have this, like a, it's like a cheesecloth, you know, they're kind of garments. And when it was new and you would wash it and use it and whatever, it would then shrink. You know, like you put something in the dryer, okay? But they didn't have dryers. But same concept. And so he says, no one takes a new garment and there's a, like a patch. You need to patch an old garment, which is already shrunk and, and you take a new one and then you, you, you fit it on the patch, and then you use it, and then that new one hasn't shrunk yet. So now it shrinks, and it makes the tear worse, and that don't even, doesn't look good. It doesn't make, like, he's like, no one does that. Okay, that's what he means. And no one puts new wine skin, new wine into old wine skins, or else the new wine will burst the wine skins and be spilt, and the wine skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wine skins, and both are preserved. The tragedy there is that the wine is spilled. Because in the New Testament, the wine is the stuff of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the flowing of the Spirit. And what was tragic? Not that the wineskin broke. The wineskin is the structure, the form, whether it's the, the leadership structure in a church or the, 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 the leadership or the, the governmental structure in a whole movement of God, or it's the structure. And you would put grape juice or wine you know, grape into a uh, wineskin and then it would start to ferment inside there and it would stretch and expand and get really tight. And the whole fermentation process would happen inside there and at the end you would have wine. But once it was already done that, if you put more fresh in there, it would stretch too much and burst. But that wine that was made inside there would always be good in there. And that, that's why it became old wine. You could store it in there and it became mature that's how they used to make wine, right? So he answers this question about fasting, and he gives a parable of a wineskin, which has to do with structure and leadership and government, in a sense, government in the church, structure, and, and that which contains the wine. The body of Christ is to contain the wine, contain the flow, not contain it to limit, but to hold it in order to bless people. And he gives something else, which is a garment, there is a prevailing language through the whole Old Testament, and I be actually believe it's the same in heaven, but I won't get into that, through the whole Old Testament that garments have to do with identity. And so now these guys come to Jesus and they say, how come your disciples don't fast, but John's do? And in a sense, we do. We fast twice a week. John's, he makes them fast. But your disciples, you're the so-called Messiah. Why don't your disciples fast? 
and he gives a very interesting answer. He gives you two things, like I said, but both of them had, in a sense, become what? Brittle or rigid? He's saying the wineskin was not flexible and the, the cloth was not flexible anymore. And so what happens is sometimes as people, when it comes to fasting, go back to that. There's a lot more I could say about that. But sometimes we become inflexible in the things of God and the things of the kingdom. We become inflexible into structures. We just, this is the way it must be. Well, that's what was happening in a sense with Judaism at the time. They were struggling to see the Messiah and to make a shift away from the law into the Messianic kingdom era that the Old Testament speaks about. And they were struggling to make that shift. And they'd become rigid in their structure, stuck in their covenant thinking. And he said, you're, you're not flexible. You're not seeing what's actually going on here. You're so rigid and stuck that you can't see the things of God, even if they're in front of you. And it's because you've put your identity in the wrong thing and you don't want the new wine that I've come to give you. But the question was about fasting. And he says basically in our vernacular, they will fast, but they will not fast like you're fasting. He said they will fast in a sense like I fasted. What was the thing that Jesus heard just before you went into the desert. This is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. That's it. You just heard that. In the next verse, and the Spirit took him into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days. He fasted from the position of a secure, loved son who loves his father. No distance between them. And he fasted from that position. And it says he went into the desert filled with the Spirit. But it says he came out of the desert in the power of the Spirit. There was a power element that took place. Even for the Son. And he said, they're not going to fast like you're fasting. With pomp and ceremony. And, you know, and in a rigid structure and with legalistic minds, they're not going to fast like that. But when I've gone, they'll fast in those days. But I'm going to model something that they can fast like, which is a son that is loved. They will fast like me. They won't fast like you. And that is very assuring to our heart that we can fast that way today. He said we'll fast in these days. So we, we will. So I encourage you, if you're here, you're obvious, obviously God is moving your heart to consider fast with us. If you're here, you've come to, we've come together so we can look at God's word together. I encourage you to do a few things. Make a plan. Don't be too intense, okay? Don't do what I did, please. <laughs> but intensity is not always bad. It's not. I've had to learn that. Sometimes you push past things it's a tenacity and I understand that but be wise but don't be too intense but make a plan how long you're going to fast what type of fast you're going to do write down what you're fasting for I would encourage you to write a little prayer you don't have to I do I try to write like I have a little prayer here you know father I humble myself before you I set my heart to seek your face because that's what the scripture says a few little lines and I'll read that out every day before I start praying about the things I'm fasting for. Just to set the right tone. And what it does is it gives me a structure to start. Because uh, if you know me for five minutes, sometimes structure is not my strength. So I give myself a little structure to work with him. And it just helps me. And it gives me a structure to start. So I just encourage you to do that. And when you come out, we'll be praying into all sorts of different things. But, you know, come out and pray. But also, while you come out, you can also pray for the things. We're going to do our best to give people the time to pray for the things that they're fasting for, too. We give a few minutes for that some of the time so that it's not just corporate. Because sometimes people are so busy and they're fasting, they're doing their best, and, you know, then they come out and it's corporate, corporate, corporate prayer. They go home and then they have to try to find another time. 
I'd, inc I'd encourage you to try to find a little time. If you're fasting together, husband and wife, um, <laughs> try pray together. If the detox is making you so grumpy that that's not going to work, then just pray separate. Pretty much. Because <laughs> sometimes the first five or six days, depending on how long you fast, if you're fasting two days, you know, this, you could do, say, I'm just going to fast lunch every day this week. You could say, I'm going to fast two full days. You know, fasting two full days, full, full days is actually fasting three, in a sense, because you, you stop eating, say, Monday or Sunday or whenever you want, and then you start drinking water. Well, it's that whole first night. That's why they call it breakfast, you know, breakfast. So that whole first night you've had no food while you're asleep. Then it's two full days. Then the whole next night, it's like 36 hours. That's a long time to go without food if you've never fasted before. And I'd encourage you, if you are going to do water, start with vegetables. Start with broth the day before. Like, just put some five. Don't eat meat and then fast. That's not a good idea. Put some stuff in you. Use some wisdom. Give yourself, like, the best chance. <laughs> and uh, if you drink coffee or a lot of caffeine or energy drinks, or have a lot of sugar, you do what you want. But I would encourage you, if you're going to fast water, stop those things three or four days before because you'll have a bunch of headaches. Well, let's say you won't. Praise, help us, Lord. But if you get headaches... Try have that before you start a water fast because it can be a l pretty intense if that's all happening at the same time. So I sometimes try to start, you know, but that's, I'm always trying to prepare for a longer fast, but I try to stop caffeine a week before, which sometimes makes me awful to my family <laughs> the week before. They're like, you haven't even started fasting yet. You're so grumpy. Well, I'm not drinking coffee. So, you know, try to start something so that it's not all all in one go. But if you're doing a short fast, even a full day of water, that sounds easy. It's not, you know, just one day of water. Um, whatever you're doing, write it down. Write down what you're praying for. Have a plan. Tell your spouse, this is what I'm thinking of doing. You know, talk about it and uh, set some time to pray. And we are praying as a leadership uh, that people will really have some burning bush experiences. So, we're trusting for that. So bless you. Thanks for coming out. It's 8.48. I made it before 9. I hope that was helpful. And uh, just to put some, some things in your hands. Can I do one more thing? Are there any questions? I can take maybe one or two. We have a mic. Are there any questions? There's no... Yes. So, uh, is there a thing to That's up to you. That's up to you. You can fast one meal. You can fast the whole day. That's really up to you. It's more the heart position. Fasting is very powerful, but if you want to fast for a whole day, say like I want to fast Tuesday or Wednesday, then yeah, then it's, you know, it's all meals if you want to fast that day. A lot of people d don't eat anything until you know, they, they fast until like sunrise. Some people do that. So it's really up to you. Yes. Me, water fasted? Longest? Non-medically supervised. Yeah, because I did that clinic last year. Um, I think 18 days. Yeah. There was a guy in South Africa who used to fast 40 days every year. He was from, it was a, like a tribal guy. I mean, that guy. He used to have two wardrobes, for real. Like, two wardrobes. He would be like a stick figure and then he would put on weight the whole year. We would watch him. <laughs> He'd put on weight the whole year. I always thought like, how healthy is this? And then he would get to January and just, <laughs> but he would like see, I mean, he had a lot of encounters with the Lord, but yeah. But yeah, for me, it wasn't, wasn't that long. It wasn't that long. It felt very long. I fasted uh, when we were coming into this building, I got the lease. And we had the lease, and I was about to sign it, and I had a dream. And the Lord said to me in the dream, fast until you've signed the lease. And I told the Lord he tricked me, because I thought, like, we were just about to sign it. I'm like, this is going to be easy. Sure. So I got up, and I said, yes, Lord, I will fast until we sign the lease. You have, like, I will do it. Well, after that, 
all things fell apart. And then I knew why I was fasting. You know, you go back and forth with a contract. Now, this was the first like, lease I had ever signed. I'd never done anything like this. I was very naive. I was just like, read it, make a few adjustments, and sign it. Well, they didn't like that. So it went back and forth. And I didn't fast water the whole time, but I did, you know, like, a, like water, and then I did some Daniel fast in between, then back to water. But it ended up being 32 days. And I was like, Lord, I'm going to do it. And it was started in November. And Christmas was coming. <laughs> and I remember saying to the Lord, on Christmas I eat lamb. That's what I do. It's even in the Bible. Like, I eat lamb. And, like, I eat lamb. And that's coming. And it's getting real close. And the guy, the owner, this is how we got in here, um, signed the lease on December 23rd. I was like, praise you, Jesus. I have two days to get my stomach back to normal <laughs> so I can eat lamb. So I was very spiritual about it. But I was actually, I got, there was a series of five dreams in that fast that literally, by the grace of God, it's never happened before or after, so like that, five dreams that the Lord would come to me and say, do this, do this, that guided that process to get in this building. And then I knew why I was fasting, just to get rid of all the stuff because I needed to really hear from the Lord. So, but it's, I've done fasts that are awful. Some fasts feel like, like you feel like, man, it's working. And some fasts you're like, it ain't working. <laughs> it's just hard, you know, but it's okay. Any, one more question? You have any at all? Anything? We're good. <laughs> like we're all going to go eat now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stephen came in with, with Chick-fil-A, and he's like, have we started fasting yet? <laughs> I was like, no, you can come in. It was pretty funny. Bless you guys. Lord, thank you. We love you. And uh, we bless you, Lord. And we, 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 we trust for a wonderful fast time. I'll see you guys Sunday. Amen.